Muammar Gaddafi was a lieutenant in the Libyan army in 1969 when he spearheaded a coup and took control of the country. For the first seven or eight years of his reign, until 1977, he would seem like a pretty standard dictator, military dictator type. He promoted himself to colonel and led a uh, revolutionary command council. But then something happened in 1977. I don't know whether he suffered a head injury or something, but he decided not to lead the Libyan state as a normal dictator, but instead to declare himself brotherly leader and guide of the revolution of the great socialist people's Libyan Arab Jamiraya. He postulated a theory, the third universal theory, which was basically his um, his insane view on how society should be restructured to, to allow his, his new state to function. I'm Arnie Craven, and with me this week, as every week, to discuss Colonel Gaddafi's third universal theory, I have Jack Harrington. Hello, once again. Chris Whitwood. Here as ever. And Jack Bannon. Good evening. Chris, I'll start with you. Tell us a bit about brotherly leader, a guide of the revolution, Colonel Gaddafi. Well, as you said, he was ruler of Libya for oh, about four decades, over four decades, which is quite a feat in itself. Gaddafi always sort of saw himself as the leader of a Libyan revolution. As a teenager, he'd recruit friends into a plan to infiltrate the army and overthrow the government. This he did in 1969 in what he termed Operation Jerusalem. And while the king was out of the country, the Libyan leader at the time, Gaddafi's forces seized control and it was probably one of the most peaceful coups in history. The senior generals who he took power from just kind of gave up without a fight. Now, one of Gaddafi's boyhood heroes was Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt. And as a boy, he would recite his speeches, memorise and recite them verbatim. And you can really see this coming through in the work of the Green Book. Thanks, Chris. Now, I'm going to go to Jack Bannon in a moment because I'm really interested in Jack's view. Jack Bannon and I, some listeners may know, actually went to the same university and, and studied under the same professors in our younger days. And so we've both read many, many similar things, I would suggest. So I'm especially interested in your view because I've got, I had an alarming realisation the more I read of Gaddafi's book. And this, this realisation happened twice. It happened when I was reading book one, his, his assessment of democracy, and reading book two, his assessment of the economy. On both occasions, I went into it thinking... This will be insane. This will be this will be just lunacy, like the rest of the stuff we read. I fear that I've come to the realization that Colonel Gaddafi's critical assessment of the problems of modern democracy is one of the most cogent, <laughs> coherent, meaningful, and insightful bits of political philosophy I've ever read. Bannon. You and I have read similar things. Am I losing my mind? Is lockdown affecting me and, and distorting my ability to make good judgment calls? Uh, unfortunately, I too concluded that Gaddafi is one of the great political sages of the 20th century. <laughs> and I, I don't know what to feel about that. It started really well. It starts with the phrase, the Green Book presents the ultimate solution to the problem of the proper instrument of government. And I thought... Bang on. You know, this is meat and two veg, despots, bookshelf material. This is going to be absolutely insane. I mean, However, anything with the phrase ultimate solution starts ringing an alarm bell anyway. Or an alarm bell for great <laughs> podcast content. <laughs> well, true. Here's my basic line on it. I think Gaddafi sees the problems within modern politics and modern society quite clearly. And I think he actually puts them across in kind of a succinct and easily understood way because this is written for the people of Libya and his basic gist in this first part of the book is he says that representative democracy is bad okay it doesn't work fundamentally you're giving away your sovereignty to another person but that other person isn't necessarily acting within your interests because of all these different factors firstly they work for a political party so they have to put forward the party's line, even though that's not maybe what you voted for as an individual. He has an issue with plebiscites. He says that you can't have binary choices in politics. It doesn't make any sense. And he hates first-past-the-post democracy and things like that. 
So in some ways, you could see Gaddafi as a modern 21st century political thinker because a lot of these issues that he brings up are the same issues that are coming up in the contemporary political debate, particularly from, I would say, maybe the modern Labour Party in the UK. Carrington, I'll come to you. You must have been reading um, Book One and thinking, God, this is like a unlock democracy. It, it was Reform very much pamphlet, the UK surely. third sector could be, particularly the supporters of, could be writing um, these issues. And yeah, there, there's a lot of good analysis as to what could be or what are frequently um, problems with representative democracy. I think most people's issue with representative democracy is it often doesn't represent very well. So it's basically going through all the occasions or all the reasons why you'll say elected representative might not represent you. Obviously, the fact that there's always going to be in an election, there's always going to be losers and those people won't be represented. He goes through. And yeah, it's it's quite compelling. And I was starting to have the Bannon Craven moment of going, what, what, why is this making sense? Why is M- 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 Gaddafi, who can't even decide how his name is spelt, why is he making sense in a book of literature to me right now? <laughs> well, so I, I, I agree, and I'll, I'll come to you in a sec, Chris, to ask for your view. But one of the things I think is, you know, his criticisms of representative democracy, Edmund Burke somewhere is in the ground sweating reading this because they are they are cutting. He's cutting <laughs> criticism. And when he speaks about, you know, people standing in long, apathetic, silent queues to cast their ballots in the same way they throw paper into the wastebasket, this is true. This is absolutely true. But one of the things which Bannon and Carrington you've not touched on, which I found probably the most interesting bit of um, chapters one to five, is where he, he sort of has a thinly veiled attack on communism. And I'll I'll open this up to see if anyone has any thoughts on this. I thought his contention that when you start doing class-based politics, what you do is one class assesses correctly the the problems of the other classes. In communism, the working class looks at the upper classes, looks at the bourgeoisie and thinks they're tossers, they're appalling people, they control the means of production and they they keep us down. And then, as such, they, they overthrow the upper classes, they overthrow the bourgeoisie. Gaddafi's assessment that the problem with communism is that it doesn't recognise that once the, the working class takes power, bits of the working class start to become the ruling class and start, start to demonstrate the exact same problems that the bourgeoisie demonstrated before the revolution. And as such, the working class just stratifies to mimic the same class structure. Isn't that really interesting? This isn't an original thought on communism. It, it's basically... Trotsky's The Revolution Betrayal. He writes and he has his big Pikachu moment of, oh my God, when we took over, we became the ruling class. It's like, well, it, yes, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> like, So yeah, Gaffey looks upon the these sort of totalitarian regimes, seemingly isn't blind and also thinks that his populace isn't blind. So I think that's the main thing I t- actually took away from it, that he certainly wasn't treating his audience as idiots. He started off with a very cogent and understandable truth, certainly a decent argument about problems. And then there's later on, he tries to slip some stuff in under the radar. Well, I think in terms of his whole approach, it's quite distressing. I mean, reading these things, it's it's increasingly distressing because you're looking at what is essentially the works of some of the worst dictators and despots in human history. These are people who are sadistic, they've committed torture and war crimes. In Gaddafi's case, crimes against fashion. <laughs> and you're looking and thinking... Disagree. I, Disagree strongly. <laughs> we'll, we'll discuss this later, but you're wrong. And you're thinking, yeah, actually, he's got a point here. You know, Idi Amin said apartheid's bad. Colonel Gaddafi had problems with first past the post. Saddam Hussein thinks that uh, eating with a fork is more hygienic. Yeah, I agree with these guys. But unlike any of the others that we've read so far, this is structure. It's got chapters and structures in a way that Saddam's (laughs) on democracy or um, Idi Amin's Ugandan tourist board promotion didn't have. It's, it had sentences with verbs in which Kim Jong-il didn't have. Chris, we, um, we've identified that Colonel Gaddafi didn't like political parties, but what were his thoughts on other sorts of parties? I mean, the man was a party animal. 
you, you've seen how he dresses. You've, you've got to be pretty wild to go out in some of those outfits. I want you to have a guess. Per month, at sort of, you know, the, his peak Gaddafi, how much was he spending per month on a party? Craven, you're quite, um, shall we say, ostentatious when you, you celebrate. How much would you spend in a month <laughs> on partying? Arnie Craven, ostentatious. That is the, the least Sorry, did, did I mean, I'm not, I've, not I've ostentatious, ever... I meant pretentious. <laughs> well, that, that's just offensive. <laughs> Don't edit this out. I want people to hear the attack. <laughs> Scaling. How much did Gaddafi spend? Uh, how much did Gaddafi spend a month on party? Well, I did read that at, on the year of his um, departure from office, shall we say, in 2011, he'd accumulated around 200 billion pounds. That was his net wealth. So, <laughs> net wealth, yeah. Um, a, a reasonable, that's a, that's reasonable a small fortune. Wad. Yes, it is rather, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to, on that basis, predict that he was spending. $500,000 a month on partying. Okay. Uh, Carrington, um, just by way of perspective, how much would you spend per month on parties? Well, as you know, I scrape together my existence in a subsistence manner, and I'm just there in sort of dour dinge, not celebrating life via the expense of currency. So, um, I would say a good £15 uh, could go a long way. Blimey, £15. Uh, any other bet, Bannon? So, my at my most debauched, uh, I've managed to spend £1,000 in a week on drinking. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Impressive. So, by that... Just drinking, Bannon. Nothing else. <laughs> Convenient edit. And I would say, on that basis, let's say he has 300 people at the party. Yeah, that's £300,000. Let's times it by four. 12... 1.2 million. One source that I found had him down as spending £22 million per month on parties. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I could summarise that um, that our view on Gaddafi, at least his assessment of the demo of democracy, is that he was spot on. I think we may disagree with him though in terms of his prescription for fixing the political system. Chris, could you summarise for us what Gaddafi's proposed new solution is for democracy? What his third universal theory is all about? So he, he approaches this with a series of questions. It, it sort of felt to me like reading an undergrad political science essay. And his solution was to introduce a series of popular conferences and people's committees, whereby you have different groups and different professions gather together and they represent their profession and then there's a committee and a, a basic popular conference and a non-basic popular conference and somehow this magically works to allow society as a whole to make decisions directly where everyone's involved. The glaring issue with this is it's just renaming some of the issues that he's already identified. It's just a change of names and he highlights the issue with politics based on sectarianism and parties or um, different classes, but by getting people to, quote, form themselves into their own professional popular conferences, he's just creating a profession-based sectarianism. He's not actually solving the issue here. In some ways, he makes it even more representative than a Western form of government, because if I've read it rightly, he basically believes that you should elect your civil service through a popular conference. So society is there to both enact the laws and to enforce them and you know you make decisions and then enact them it did feel slightly odd i thought that he spends time slamming parliaments as being people ceding power away from themselves and how direct democracy is the solution and how edmund burke was a tosser with terrible <laughs> ideas about everything not to labor that joke for the second time <laughs> And then his, his solution that, that's is... That's a mug waiting have... to be made. Edmund Burke is a tosser. <laughs> let's have, have you got uh, a problem is... with Edmund Burke here, Arnie? This is the niche audience we, uh, we appeal to. Um, and then his solution is, let's form sectoral parliaments. And then let's have a random, an almost random process of, of selecting people to sit in these parliaments. And let's have them definitely not elect people to sit in the high-level parliament, but select through discussion and debate. Gaddafi was sadly quite on the money with the issues society faces, and then his solutions were 
a bit out there. And for me, this came through here more than anywhere else when he speaks about how law should be formed. Now, before I express my views on this, does anyone have any views on Gaddafi's sections on the formation of laws? I think the key alarm bell phrase here, as with any of the books that we've read so far, is the Green Book guides the masses. Guides the masses is sort of like dictator set phrase 101. I think his... his, um view on religion was one of the choice wacky parts of the book where he goes laws defined by a constitution are inherently flawed because they have been involved in political machinations and political parties so we must revert to a natural law well what does a natural law mean it's a law based on religion and that's his conclusion he argued that Religion contains tradition, and tradition is an expression of the natural life of people. Therefore, religion is an affirmation of natural laws which are discerned therein. And I think this is another thing that marks Gaddafi out from the other people we've looked at, in that he did have a, a quite a deeply held religion, although you know he clearly avoided the bits about not killing and torturing people and just being nice to others. Whereas people like Saddam and Kim Jong-il were very much anti-religion or certainly, you know, pushing it away from politics. Um, Gaddafi was always very publicly... Uh, Carrington, I think you've Muslim. got something to add. Slash, you may disagree. I think that in, in the way that, um, say, Gaddafi's been borrowing from, say, Trotsky and looking at all these other sort of states that have gone before him, I think he's also realised, like, why did all these socialists waste so much time and energy trying to, like, stamp out religion from society? Like, I think he just saw that and thought, that seems like a lot of effort. This isn't where I want to put my political and military capital. I I think it's slightly more tactical. He's just thought, we might as well, in some way, incorporate this into the society and the vision I have. Because, to be honest, I probably won't be able to stamp it out anyway. So if I just say it's part of everything if I absorb it in and then I get to do all the high-level political and policy stuff. It sort of neuters a possible um, centre of opposition. Bannon, you, you viscerally disagree, I can see. You're shaking your head. I think this this might be me putting my own lens onto this, but I think at his core, Gaddafi is a socialist anarchist. So he identifies the problems with society. He says that he has a big issue with people ceding their sovereignty. He doesn't like representation. But he it's almost impossible to write a manifesto to govern a state on the principles of socialist anarchy. So he's had a good go at sort of bashing one together, but it's layered with contradiction because, of course, it is. You cannot have an anarchist socialist state. Can I throw something into the mix here? And you know, we touched on Gaddafi's hatred of class politics and certainly classes being a basis for a political party. Could that have something to do with his own background? He came from a Bedouin tribe. He was born in a tent and you know the Bedouin in Libya at the time were very much sort of the, the gypsies of Libyan society. They, they were at the bottom rung of, sort of the social hierarchy. Do you think that could have impacted on his opinion towards uh, political structures. I think there is this inherent contradiction, and I think you may well be right, Chris, that he he was born into a very poor family and he, he actually joined the military to climb in society. But I think this contradiction comes through, and I think this is something we'll see time and again. And his his bit about the creation of law, his bit about the press was very similar in, in the contradiction. He identifies the problem well, it is almost a religious undertone in his bit about creation of the law, you know, about how constitutions are man-made documents and men are imperfect because of the way that men form things. And it's almost like there's, there's a bit missing. He almost desperately is trying to get to a religious appeal and then can't quite get there. And it leads to this, this nonsense, this, this, the nonsense that all law must be based on religion and tradition. I mean... How does that work in the in the <laughs> era of space exploration? Have you heard of the nation of Saudi Arabia? Uh, Arne? What does religion well, and tradition tell us about space law? That is my question. To I you mean, all. he doesn't spec. He doesn't. Sp- yeah, but he doesn't specify which religion. I mean, he presumably means Islam. But you know, when he disbanded the Revolutionary Command Council, which had been governing Libya between 1969 and 1977. 
he did so because he discovered a new political system as an alternative to capitalism and communism, this third international theory. And it's not only did he want to be some sort of statesman th- philosopher, but his discovery of a new political system was kind of like the discovery of the Book of Mormon. Are you li- are you likening the third international theory to Mormonism? What? Is that an interesting, I an just interesting did. postulation? <laughs> now, the the gold plates in upstate tripper. <laughs> We have uh, we have much to talk about in the way of Gaddafi's views on the economy. Before we move on to that, does anyone have any final observations on Gaddafi's assessment of politics? So I think what this exposes, and it's something that we we touch on inherently in Despot's Bookshelf, but I don't think we've really explored it, is the idea of the complexity of man. We're looking at these people, and which you were saying earlier, how it sits uneasily with us that these people who have done these terrible things have ideas that we might sympathise with or that we might have even had ourselves and they can have some good ideas and they can have some really reasonable positions but how can you sum up an individual because I think if we went out and really said about this podcast well we sort of concluded from the Green Book and from the Green Book in isolation that Gaddafi is a pretty bright guy and we kind of like him I think there'd be an, an, an uproar But I think that's also kind of a really valid claim. My main takeaway, and this extends beyond to other things, is just the the level of irony and contradiction that comes up in these sort of texts. So yeah, he's trying to figure, well, representative democracy isn't democratic enough for Gaddafi, and he keeps going on about the problem, yet he was. He genuinely was. He was a dictator. He went, like, forget all the problems with representative democracy, he was imposing his will. So yeah, that, that's sort of the profound one that keeps coming up for me. Gaddafi then talks about the economy. And I've got to admit to listeners once again, I fear that I'm sounding like a shill for Gaddafi. I read this stuff, I read his assessment of the economy, and I thought, preach. You absolute hero. You hero. You <laughs> you tell us that people have to work for wages are de facto slaves. Anyone who's employed to do anything is a slave because they cannot remove anything they want from their workplace. You you tell us, Colonel Gaddafi. Are all wage earners slaves? Notorious libertarian Jack Carrington. There is nothing notorious about me. I wish. I wish I was famous. No one knows. But um, so my my passively small L libertarian leanings. No. Say, we go to the core, you have the right to the product of your own labour and of gift or trade thereafter. I feel if you sign a contract to do some menial task for nine to five each week, that seems all right. It depends on what you're getting for it and what your other options are and if there's a social safety net of such. What was his ultimate economic contention, Bannon? His ultimate economic contention is that anybody who works for a wage... Well, you shouldn't work for a wage. You should be a stockholder in a company with which you work. So basically, his idea is that everybody in Libya is either self-employed or they are a joint shareholder in some kind of larger enterprise. I'm a big fan of his chapter on land. His bit on land goes on and on and on for pages and pages... And I think about the first three lines of the ten pages on land are actually about (laughs) land. And by page five, he's discussing the manufacture and production of apples, which I actually thought was one of the most interesting bits. Did did anyone read about the manufacture and production of apples and think, as I did, this is an interesting assessment of, of human psychology, but the literal opposite of socialism, the actual polar opposite of it. It was really interesting, actually, because he talks about creating a socialist society, but he says that the best example is where a worker produces 10 apples for himself, as opposed to producing 10 apples for another person and getting wages, or producing 10 apples for society and getting one back. He's jumped straight to um, Deng Xiaoping rather than Mao. He's just sort of realised that, wait, um, we can actually... More will be done if people feel they're working for themselves. Obviously, there's huge contradictions, but yeah. I mean, I don't think he's jumped to uh, Deng Xiaoping. I think he's actually jumped straight in. He's gone full and round. (laughs) I can see that, yeah. Bannon. He says that 
if you work for wages, you will be unmotivated and you won't work well. And as someone who worked for wages and who spent the large majority of his time painting very low quality acrylic portraits of my co-workers <laughs> I can absolutely I, I particularly to that. enjoyed your um, high quality acrylic portrait of Gaddafi yeah I had drunk a bottle of red wine uh, we could put that on the Twitter I feel that we need to be shared with the both of our listeners alright but here's, here's how I read this section Gaddafi basically outlines the labour theory of value and he says that the value of a good comes from the labour that's put into it rather than the ownership therefore you should share things equally so that's textbook sort of left wing thing but then he brings in this idea of motivation and the motivation is the profit incentive so there's an inherent contradiction there where he says okay well we should share things but the only way you get people to work is by incentivizing them with profit but then he goes on to say if you have a surplus it should be you can save a small amount of it but the rest of it must be redistributed among the among the people of the state therefore you do not have a profit incentive i mean you'd be absolutely screwed if you worked at a factory producing something really unpleasant wouldn't you <laughs> in the gaddafi world if you if you if you're producing that like mouse poison and the, the, your, your income is just loads of mouse poison and nothing else with very remind me not to come to up to yours for dinner <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna sound quite old here, but I'm I'm a big fan of memes. Uh, I follow lots of memes on Twitter. Daddy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of the of the meme which which has is a three line block of text. The first line is the action. The second line is three question marks, <laughs> and the third line is profit. <laughs> I, I, I was reading Gaddafi's um, contentions on on uh, the economy, and it, it, it basically seemed like strange libertarian approach to having lots of pens manufactured <laughs> and sole ownership of mouse traps. Three question marks uh, and apples, for that matter. Three question marks. Socialism, <laughs> and I think there's a there's a big gap here. There's a big gap. I, I don't. He's his anarchist approach to his opposition to wages and his opposition to people being paid to do so <laughs> and his, his, his belief that they should just take take the visceral value from the apples that you're producing question mark question mark question mark socialism <laughs> seem like a seem like an issue notice though and it's the final thing i'll say on this before because i, I fear i'm dominating this conversation notice the guy who, who produces the apples is not demotivated because he's got to give his uh, got to give a third of his um, his profit to the apple fertilizer manufacturer or the spade producer the guy who gets the apples can keep everything i i, I think there's big holes in this theory he also claims that factories have directly replaced camels, which I found, <laughs> which I found contentious. The, the, I think, yeah, the factories moving gradually across the Silk Road. <laughs> Just the, gen, the gentle grazing of a factory in the wild. <laughs> did, you, did you not see the, the David Attenborough documentary about the grazing factory? Yeah, you should be careful when you go into a factory. They spit in your eye. The final thing, the final thing I would say... I, I did think it probably is worth some some consideration. The more I read of it, the more you know, it felt a bit Tony Blair's third way in some of his contentions. There was a bit of Blairism coming through and he likes private property, but as long as you're not using it to dominate others. He likes home ownership, he's got a, a bit of a thatcher going on and his dislike of um council housing and, and state owned housing. But you can only have one house for your family. You cannot dominate. You cannot control others. <laughs> That's quite polite, Cymru, that, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> as long as you're from, as long as you're from, if you're from Tripoli, you can't have a second home in Misrata. Said uh, said Gaddafi. Don't you dare go to Benghazi when there's a flu going around. <laughs> Two hundred fifty miles away. Since since we're um, listing place names, Arnie, can you just say Benghazi in your best <laughs> William Hague voice? The attack on the U.S. embassy in Benghazi was an outrage. And something to do with a um, a pizza shop in Washington DC, I understand. Oh. That's a different podcast though. A different podcast. Chop oh, chop. We Let's get that out. That. <laughs> Leave that in. Leave that in. <laughs> <laughs> 
because of the the nature and, and the comprehensive strangeness of Gaddafi's book, there's enough material for two podcasts here. So we're actually we're going to spam this. We're going to spam Gaddafi's Green Book over two. We're going to come back and talk about his views on society, which is just a roller coaster of lunacy. You know, if you think his his random views on apple <laughs> production are, are something, wait until we get to menstruation. But for now. I'm going to offer a sort of semi-conclusion that Gaddafi's book was disappointingly not insane. It was, for me, at least when it comes to the economy and to democracy, it was the most sincere attempt I've read in some time to identify the problems we all see in democracy and representative democracy and lack of participation. And in the economy, there were some things which ran really true in terms of non-jobs and wages sometimes not motivating people but his solutions were were sometimes odd sometimes hysterical but most often just not applied not applied in reality and not reflective of his business when he actually ran the state so i'm going to give this first section the first two books of Gaddafi's green book a sad one basket out of five Carrington, what's your midway point assessment? I'm reluctant to give one, um, but I think there's there's a giddy naivety to it, and I think that's what it is. It's not insa- necessary insanity in terms of the text, but it is at the very least maximal naivety. I think we could two point five. Wait, what? I've got to go with you, actually, Arnie, and heavily caveated by the fact that this does not match up to reality uh, in terms of how he, he governed Libya. I'm going to have to go for one. It's contradictory, but he assesses the issues in a, a critical way. He's structured it. It's using full sentences, which mostly make sense. One basket. And Bannon. If you gave the Despot's Bookshelf team ultimate power over a state and told us to write a manifesto, what would we produce? And I think we might identify some of the same (laughs) problems that Gaddafi has. And we laugh at the solutions, but what solutions would we come up with? If you give a normal person total power and impunity to say whatever they like, what, what, what becomes of that? So for me, one basket. A great question to end on, Bannon. And we will we'll come back to this, I think, when we talk about Gaddafi's views on society. And this is where he really started to go off uh, go off at the deep end. Final thing for this episode, then, uh, as we often do, we uh, we've all picked out a favourite quote. Chris, what was your favourite quote from the book? Like I said, there's not a huge amount of insane stuff in there, but I'm going to have to go for the freedom of a human being is lacking if his or her needs are controlled by others. For need may lead to the enslavement of one person by another. Furthermore, exploitation is caused by need. Need is an intrinsic problem and conflict is initiated by the control of one's needs by another. And I chose that quote not because it's particularly insane or profound, but because it's the entirety of chapter 12. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Wits. Bannon, do you have a quote? Share with us. Three words. Freedom is indivisible. Excellent. Carrington? Yeah, I think the one that sort of really gets into say some of the later ways how he governed i think this is the quote that he really took to heart um and would appease uh, jimmy carr and all the rest one's income is a private matter <laughs> <laughs> now there are a few for me i don't think i can top uh, carrington's i um, we've only started around it here we could have spent a lot more time on on various matters i was particularly fond of his oddly narrow view about people expressing their opinions his statement Private individuals have the right to express only their own and not anyone else's opinions, (laughs) which leads to a fascinating conversation with Mr. Gaddafi, I'm sure. What does he think? I I can't tell you what he thinks. I can only talk. What what, what did someone say to you? I don't know. I cannot express what someone said to me. (laughs) Only what I believe. Nothing else. Nothing else. And on that note, we shall close and come back on the next episode to talk about Colonel Gaddafi on society, which, dear listeners, I can assure you is sincerely insane.